So yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, turning up to my presentation. I'm James. I work at Google in the Project Zero team. I'm very much focused on finding vulnerabilities in the Windows operating system. I mainly look for elevation and privilege vulnerabilities. And one of the things that I come across quite a lot is attacking RPC services. And one of my deficiencies I found in RPC services is being able to call them from the .NET managed language like C Sharp, Visual Basic .NET, things like that. So I wanted to actually implement a solution to this tooling problem. So the rough overview of this presentation will go through the various things I did to actually develop my tooling. So I will give a rough overview for the audience of how Windows RPC is currently programmed and why we need actually some .NET tooling for this. Then I'll go into actually how I did that sort of implementation through the various different stages I actually had to go through to actually produce a, a working piece of tooling. And then I'll run through some demos at the end just to sort of show it in action. And hopefully you can take away, if you actually do any sort of Windows research, you can take some of that information away and actually look for interesting RPC services. So yes, you may think, why, why are we that interested in this? Well, RPC services are a, a useful mechanism to do privilege separation on Windows. So you write your system service, which is running as a high privilege user, uh, but you want to provide access to that, those services to lower privilege users. So what do you do about it? Well, there's various different techniques. You could implement some sort of custom protocol over, say, a named pipe. But Windows provides you a built-in mechanism, this RPC mechanism, to actually do remote procedure calls uh, or inter-procedure calls between two different processes on the same system. They're all securable. Uh, they can all be um, exposed in a safe manner. But of course, if the code itself is unsafe, you can find security vulnerabilities in it, and that can lead to elevation of privilege or even potentially remote code execution because these can be accessed remotely. But I'm only really interested in the local attack surface here. So programming wise, if you're a developer, you have your system service, you think, yeah, I really want to add some sort of RPC service to my existing uh, implementation. How do I go about it? Um, well, to start off, this is the sort of architectural overview of how RPC services work. And it's pretty, pretty simple, really. You have a, a RPC server, which you, of course, implement. And that is usually this thing which is running privileged. And then, of course, you have one or more clients which are going to try and access these services for you. And everything is mediated through a DLL, which is installed on every version of the Windows, this RPC RT4.dll, or the RPC runtime. And this contains all the code, such as marshalling parameters and talking the special protocol, in this case, the ALPC protocol, which is the Advanced Local Procedure Call protocol, which uses kernel services to do inter-process communication. And this is all handled in there. So the only thing we can actually affect as a developer is this RPC client and this RPC server. So when we actually write our services, these are the only pieces of code which we directly control. So what we do is, as a developer, we say, OK, we want to expose these particular functions. And we write something called an interface definition language file, or IDL file. And this is actually a, a sort of standardized file format, but of course, Microsoft have added their own spin to everything. But it's sort of a C-like uh, C -like file format. You can define structures like you would in, in a C language. Uh, but the main interesting thing you need to define, the main important thing you need to define, is your interface to your RPC server. So this isn't like a class or anything like that. This is just a, a definition of all the functions which are exposed by your RPC server. But two pieces of important information are also there. This is the unique identifier which represents what that RPC server is. So, of course, you can have multiple RPC servers on the same machine, all with different unique identifiers. But you can also version those RPC servers as well. So you take this IDL file, but this IDL file doesn't contain any actual code. 
It just contains definitions. So you need to actually pass this through a special compiler, which is comes as part of the Windows SDK, the middle compiler, sort of Microsoft IDL compiler. And it takes this IDL file and spits out uh, two main files. It spits out something called a server stub, which is actually the, the skeleton implementation for your server. And it spits out a client proxy. And this is, again, the skeleton implementation for your client. And these are both C files. So these are both for compiling into a native application. And of course, if we're dealing with .NET, that obviously causes us a problem. Now, actually, in that generated contents, you have uh, two pieces of important information. So this is in the server code itself. You have the RPC server interface structure. This defines things like the list of functions you can dispatch to. It also contains the interface ID, so that contains the unique identifier, the version of your RPC server. It contains something called your transfer syntax, and we'll come back to that later. But that's basically the sort of the defining the protocol you're going to talk between the two endpoints, so between the client and the server. And then finally, you have this interpreter info field, which actually is a pointer to a separate structure which defines your dispatch table. So in your server, you obviously have a list of functions which implement your RPC server. Uh, that's not something the middle compiler can generate for you. And then it has something called a format string. And the format string is basically a set of bytecode which defines to the RPC runtime how to marshal parameters between the client and the server. And this is obviously the pretty much the very most important part of this whole piece of information. So if you look at a format string, it looks something like this. Uh, we take a very simple function at the top. This is sort of IDL format. Uh, we have three parameters. The first one is something called a binding handle. This is used by the RPC runtime. So when you create a client, the binding handle uh, hides effectively the connection information. So you connect to the server, and it returns you a binding handle you can pass to this function to say, I want to actually talk to this server. Because of course you could have multiple different servers all implementing the same RPC interface, and you need some way of distinguishing between them. Uh, the second parameter is just a standard int, and it, the entry for that contains things like, okay, this is an inbound parameter, okay, that's great. It also says the offset on your x64 stack, your 64-bit stack, is eight from the base of the stack. And that's kind of important from its marshalling perspective. And then it says, okay, this is also a FC long, and FC means format character. And of course, you have to remember that this is probably designed originally for 16-bit windows. So long, in this case, is actually a 32-bit number, not a 64-bit number. You then have an outbound parameter. And again, it just it's effectively the same thing as the inbound parameter, except it's now got an out flag and says, hey, this actually is an outbound integer rather than an inbound integer. And then finally, you have your return code, which again is another integer. And again, it's just basically a set of flags. So these are instructions to the interpreter inside the RPC runtime to do marshalling, basically. It says, hey, look at stack offset 8. You'll find there that integer. And you need to take that integer and package it up into, into the RPC protocol. And something very similar happens with structures. So as I showed in the IDL, you can define your structures. And of course, the compiler has to generate some sort of marshalling code, marshalling script, effectively, to marshal that structure across the link. And again, it contains useful information, such as the alignment of the structure. It contains the total size of the structure. But it also contains the members themselves. And in this particular case, because we actually have padding alignment issues, so for, for example, a byte uh, is at uh, byte A is at zero offset, and then the word needs to be naturally aligned. So it needs to actually be at number uh, offset two, but of course the byte is only one one byte in size, so it must insert some sort of padding information. So uh, this allows the the runtime to actually only marshal real data, and so it's kind of it's quite rare to find memory disclosure issues due to structure padding, which would be more common in a say a kernel environment, for example. Finally, we have the client. So the client is there as, obviously, we need to call this server somehow. And this is generated at the same time by the middle compiler. 
And all it does is the compiler generates a C file which contains the function definition in a, in a more C-like format. And then all it does is it causes this NDR client call 2, which is a function implemented inside the RPC runtime, which takes the description, that sort of format string setup, and it also contains basically a pointer to the first value on the stack. So as I said, everything kind of works like using native memory addresses, and so pulls things off the stack and, and manipulates it. And again, this makes it more difficult to implement in, in a managed language because you're going to have to start simulating. If you wanted to use the actual DLL itself, you'd have to start simulating stack frames and all that sort of stuff to make sure that everything is properly aligned so that the RPC runtime could do the correct marshalling. So with that in mind, how about implementing in .NET? So I came up with a number of different options I could possibly choose. And an obvious one people may say is like, hey, why don't you just uh, modify the middle compiler to spit out C sharp or PowerShell instead of spitting out C? Well, A, the official Microsoft middle compiler does not come, it's not an open source product. There is things like the Wine project have their own middle compiler, which is open source, uh, but it doesn't necessarily contain all the features that a, uh, the actual Microsoft one does. And of course, a lot of the time when I'm doing research into RPC services, I do not have an IDL file. All I have is the executable or the DLL, which actually contains the RPC server. I don't have an IDL file. Now, there's potential options here. You can use a tool called RPC View. An RPC View contains a decompiler, which allows you to take an existing running ser uh, service and decompile its RPC interface. And then you get an IDL file. But the actual IDL compilation process is quite lossy. Uh, actually doing a reverse process, the reverse decompilation isn't guaranteed uh, to be correct. And you end up uh, in a situation where you have an IDL file, you compile it, and then you try and call it via the client, and it just fails because some subtle mistake has been made in the IDL decompilation. So I, I thought this was like, this is far too much like hard work. Like even if I implement my own middle compiler, I would have to be feature parity with the Microsoft compiler, and that just seems like a little, too much work. So instead, I thought, okay, well, I already need to act, extract my data from a DLL or an executable. Can I not just consume the DLL and executable directly rather than the IDL file? Do some munging and use that to generate my, my .NET code. Uh, and this is the actual one I chose because it solved my direct problem. Now, if you wanted to ever use this for services you actually have an IDL file for, about the only thing you can do is compile the IDL file into a, into a C library or a C, C DLL, and then use this tooling to pull it back out again to generate your C sharp. But that isn't the major use case. So there's three parts to my managed implementation I need. I need this extractor code. I need some way of extracting out this RPC server interface information. I then need some code to actually marshal parameters, so to replace that sort of interpreter, which allows me to sort of generate the correct data to transfer on the wire. And then finally, I actually need some sort of ALPC RPC client, which goes over this transport mechanism to talk to my local services. And so, of course, the first bit is replacing middle, whereas the second bit is replacing the RPC runtime. And if I can implement this all in .NET, then I don't need any managed code at all, uh, unmanaged code at all, and everything is, is far nicer. So is there already stuff which does this? Well, uh, I'll show it a bit later. There was a presentation at PAXAC two years ago, um, and... One of the outputs from this, it was talking about RPC over ALPC, and I had a bit of information about how it works. And one of the outputs from this was Python for Windows, which contains a basic RPC ALPC client, and RPC Forge, which is like a RPC fuzzer. And as you can see, RPC Forge itself is two years old since it actually did any updates. It, they never actually released the tooling to generate the interfaces themselves, so they used the modified version of the RPC View tool. Uh, which is actually open source, but he modified it, but they never released a, a uh, 
modified that modified version. So you had to manually create Python interfaces, and that just sounds like a pretty nasty thing to do. Of course, it's, it is Python, so it doesn't really help me from my .NET perspective. I could write it in I in Python, but that seems uh, probably not really worth the effort. And, and it's not even updated to Python 3. So, of course, eventually Python 2 may finally, finally go away, and of course, I can't pull that forward anyway. So even if I wanted to, it seems like a bad choice to go for this. So I have no real choice. Okay. So let's actually go into the things I actually had to deal with when implementing this. I started with the RPC parser, the ingester for the DLLs and executable content. Um, and I thought, okay, how am I going to get access to these RPC servers? You could do a manual analysis. You could just like open it and say IDA Pro. Go, okay, this is clearly the RPC server. It's being passed to this particular function. I could do my own manual like de de uh, disassembly of the binaries using various uh, cool cool tools. But I wanted to be lazy. I wanted to do the simplest possible uh, option. And <laughs> my lazy my lazy approach was. Uh, that's, that structure contains an inline GUID, this inline user interface ID for the transfer syntax. And the transfer syntax doesn't change. It's basically the same for every, every single RPC server. And so I just went, okay, I'm just going to brute force it. I'm just going to look through all memory. Can I find this up, this GUID in memory? If I do, do a bit of heuristics, check whether I've actually like found the correct RPC server interface. And if it looks good, pull out all the format string information, and there we go, job done. And that is slightly cut down for, for brevity on that slide, but it's pretty much the entirety of my, my searching code. Uh, so, okay, we've now got our RPC server interfaces, which have been pulled out of these DLLs, these executable files. We now need to actually work out what these format strings mean. And there is actually some documentation for this. So... Uh, the Microsoft uh, MSDN, if you do a search, you will find format strings. You'll talk about the, the RPC runtime. Uh, and it talks about what they are, and it goes, okay, just look in NDR types.h. But if you look in the Windows SDK, NDR types.h doesn't exist. It may have existed at some earlier version of the, the SDK, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, you can do a search on Google, and the only hits are like, Wine has some sort of copy of a file called NDR types.h. MinGW has something similar. And you can kind of piece things together. And of course, you do have the, the comments in the generated output from the middle compiler as well. So you can kind of like sort of join bits, bits and pieces together. Um, you can also pull it out of private symbols or bits of it out of private symbols. So for example, the COM library on Windows 10 has private symbols provided by Microsoft. It's not a mistake, it is intentional. Uh, if you dump the format character type, this is all the, the format characters which are at least compiled into the COM runtime. So, okay, I've, I've got some information, but it's not complete. I'm going to have to do your classic iterative approach to reverse engineering. I'm going to have to implement everything I know about uh, when I'm doing this parsing, parse every RPC server I can get my hands on, and then any failures I encounter, whether it be an unknown format character or an undocumented format character, I'm going to have to reverse engineer that and work out what it actually is doing. And so you end up with problems like this. So the official, this is an official page on Microsoft's documentation, talks about this FC hard struct uh, or FC hard structure. Uh, you find in some of the old NDR types, say from Wine, that there is an FCR hard struct, not a hard structure format character, uh, which has the value of B1. And you hit this B1 format character, and you go, oh, okay, it must be this documented structure. But of course, it's not this documented structure. It actually, at some point, became FC forced bogus struct. I don't quite know why it's bogus, but um, that's, that's its name. Anyway... Uh, it, it has a completely different format, and I managed to reverse engineer that, and it does support the, the parsing of this structure now. Of course, some uh, bytecodes are not even like, there's not even documented at all, right? So the FC unused for format code, which is value 3C in hex, uh, became the FC system handle format character in Windows 8. And this allows you to pass 
native handles between processes over RPC in a sort of simple, uh, a simple manner, a sort of all uh, supported by the operating system. And not only is this undocumented from the perspective of format codes, it's not even documented from the perspective of the IDL um, language format. So this system handle, I had to, I eventually found an example of this in the Chakra JIT server, which is open source. So you can find in there the IDL file, it contains this system handle definition. And by using that, I could then compile an IDL file with these structures and actually generate uh, the correct uh, bytecodes. And I could then obviously infer from that how that actually functions under the hood. But this is all still just like generating the the structured data, that re um, parsing out the actual sort of bytecode which is used for doing the marshalling. Um, as is as something I typically do, of course, once I've written everything in C sharp, uh, I then actually implement uh, exposed functions for PowerShell. And so there is the get RPC server function. You can pass it a DLL. You can pass it an executable. And it will try and brute force and parse every single RPC server inside that DLL or executable. Uh, you can also set a symbol resolver. So in the server's case, if you have public symbols, you can actually resolve the function names of the server. And of course, that gives you useful hints as to what that server is actually trying to do. Uh, you can actually pa pass in like a list of DLLs, so you can pass in, say, all the DLLs on in System32 and parse all that. And then finally, just so that you can kind of get a rough idea of what it looks like, because the output of this is being .NET, being PowerShell, is a structured like object graph, uh, which you can obviously manipulate directly, but sometimes it's just easier to see in text format, and so there is a format RPC server command which outputs a sort of C-sharp pseudo IDL file, which you can have a sort of rough idea of what the RPC server is doing. So we've consumed the RPC bytecode. Now we need to work out, okay, we need to implement the sort of marshalling layer itself. And the best place to go for, for this is straight to, um, the straight to the standard. So the Microsoft RPC protocol is actually based on the open groups DCE. RPC protocol, and you can go and get the down. You can download the reference file, the reference for that, and it contains in chapter 14 everything you may want to know about the transfer syntax and network data representation, because that's what NDR means. Uh, of course, that's not all that's there, and we'll see uh, some examples of where that isn't actually fully documenting everything Microsoft have done. But the thing you'll, which will strike you immediately is. Whew, there's a heck of a lot of types in here. Um, I've got to implement potentially all the primitive types, different types of strings, whether it be ANSI and Unicode, or like, I would rec if you're really, really bored one day, I'd recommend reading the standard about what varying and conformant means. Pointers, arrays, miscellaneous stuff, things like the system handles themselves, they of course have some sort of martial format. There's a lot to, lot to go at. Uh, so, of course, you hit things like this. Like, system handle is, of course, as I said, undocumented in the NDR bytecode. It's undocumented in the IDL format. And, of course, it is undocumented in the marshalling format as well, right? So, you need to, obviously, reverse engineer that. Uh, and it's also incompatible between Windows 8 and Windows 10, which makes it even more special. Um, the biggest problem actually turns out to be structures. Because A, there's a lot of structures. If you actually read the, the, uh, the original definition uh, inside the open group standard, there isn't that many structures. It's kind of just, it's a structure, right? But obviously when you have the marshalling protocol, there's various different weird quirks, different structures. For performance reasons, you may want to have like a simple structure which just contains just integers, some primitive types. If you have pointers involved, you have to start doing some funky stuff because, of course, a pointer can't be directly marshaled across this RPC layer. So there's all these various different structures I have to deal with. And, of course, the rules for marshaling structures are not always immediately obvious. So you may... I am I had a few false starts where I implemented sort of uh, marshaling in a particular way and then found out, actually, no, there's edge cases to this. If I don't consider the edge cases, it's all going to go horribly wrong. Uh, 
So for example, you have structures with pointers. In this case, we have a structure which has a, a name, which is a pointer to a string. And then I have uh, just some flags. And you may think, OK, maybe it just marshals that name buffer. And of course, just tags it somewhere which says, hey, actually, this is like 10 characters long. So 10 characters plus the character data itself. And then we can put the flags. It's just the streaming protocol. It should work, right? Well, that's not actually how it ends up getting marshaled. Instead, that pointer value actually ends up as something called a referent. It's like an em embedded pointer, as they refer to it in the standard. And this embedded pointer is just a number which uniquely identifies some sort of value which ends up being written after the structured data itself. So in this case, we have a referent, which is like a pseudo pointer, to the name data, which is after the structure. We then write the flags, and then we write the name data itself. OK, that's fine. Well, what about an array of structures? You may think, well, it's really obvious, right? Like, all I need to do, marshal the structure and marshal it again. Two structures, yeah? Simple. Of course, that's not how it works. Uh, instead, what it does is it marshals reference zero and flag zero for the first entry, and then it, the reference and the flags for the second entry, and then after the array has been marshaled, it now starts writing out the reference data itself. So you, ref you put out the first name, and then you put out the second name. And you can imagine this gets quite complicated quite quickly. And actually coming up with a solution which actually works in, in a general way without horrible hacks uh, took me a bit of a, a bit of a to and fro to try and get it to work of it. Um, and it, it does work eventually. As far as I know, it is correct. But of course, it could be horribly wrong. OK. So now we can marshal parameters. We can marshal data to pass across the link. How about implementing the ALPC client? And of course, ALPC is uh, a proprietary format. It's not documented officially by Microsoft anywhere, although you can find uh, sort of examples of this. There's been a few presentations. You have, of course, uh, Clement Ruon and Thomas Imbert's PackSec presentation, which again talks a bit about sort of the RPC side of things. Uh, and you may think, well, is it not exactly the same protocol as documented by the Open Group's DCE standard? Of course not. It's, this is the internal format designed for ALPC only. And so Microsoft decided to implement it in a different way. Uh, so again, it requires reverse engineering. And that previous presentation did do a good job of, of doing basically a, a reverse engineer of the various structures and protocols. But you can notice there's a lot of unknown fields in this, this structure. And that's just the nature of reverse engineering. If you're reverse engineering uh, a binary, Sometimes it's not immediately obvious that, OK, this field means this specific, it has this specific function. Um, and I thought, OK, maybe I could do a better job. So let's start from scratch. Let's actually go back to, to first principles. Let's reverse engineer it from scratch, um, try and avoid uh, being polluted by the, the concepts of what you can actually see, uh, which has already been done. Uh, and I went and used a simple trick that Alex Ionescu talked about, uh, I think last year at OffensiveCon in his, in his keynote. Basically, all you need to do is find a binary version of the RPC runtime which has more strings than usual. And what I mean by that is more debug strings. So if you take a checked build of Windows, so in this case I looked at Windows 8.1, which is the last major version of Windows which had a checked build widely available on MSDN, uh, you'll notice that actually there's loads of assert statements which are saying like, oh, is this value null? Is this value set? Is this bit flag set? And of course, the, if the assert fails, it prints out a nice useful debug string to help you um, debug why it's failing. And you can use this information to, of course, infer things like bit flags and names of fields in a structure. And so, of course, I, I did all this. I processed all this information. And this is actually the RPC bind structure, which we saw before uh, in, in Python, uh, all cleaned up. And as far as I know, I've, I've accounted for every single value inside the RPC bind structure now. And you get extra bonuses. So for example, there was a piece of code in the, the RPC runtime on the checked build, which read out the, the um, packet type and actually printed out the textual form of that packet type. So of course, I now know exactly what all the packet types are because it gave me the name of them for uh, very helpfully inside the, RP the Windows 8.1 check build. Um, we still have a problem. Once we've implemented all these 
Again, it's more code than you than you would realize to implement a lot of these features. Um, I needed to also be able to find the ALPC port. So an ALPC port is just exposed by name. And we would need to know that name to actually be able to connect to that RPC server. And while I tried to avoid reusing most of the RPC runtime, there is actually a really useful RPC runtime function, this resolve binding function, which you give it an endpoint. You say, I want to talk uh, over local RPC uh, to this particular interface. Uh, can you tell me possibly if you know what the ALPC port name is? And it will return you if it knows. But that only works if it's been, the server is registered with something called the endpoint mapper. And that's not actually something you need to do. You could actually expose your RPC server over a, a well-known name. So things like the, uh, the server service has a well-known name which you can connect to. Um, you can also just, you could use a different, different channel to pass along the, the randomly named ALPC port name if that was something you wanted to do. So if that doesn't work, I did also implement, again, brute forcing of the LPC port name, because if you try and bind to that interface, if you try and say, hey, do you speak this particular interface ID, this particular version? If it doesn't, it, the RPC runtime will return an error to you, and it'll say, nope, sorry, no idea what you're talking about. And so you can use this by just connecting to every single ALPC port in turn, because you can just enumerate them, and say, hey, can you talk to this interface? And if it says yes, you go, Fantastic, right, that is my ALPC port. This also has an interesting security benefit. A RPC server can actually have multiple ALPC ports, and each ALPC port can actually have separate security properties. So it can say, this one is allowed everyone to open, but this one actually only a very specific user group can open. Now it's potentially possible that a server is supposed to be exported by a heavily restrictive ALPC port, but Usually the RPC runtime multiplexes these ports together. So you could talk on a completely different port. So by doing this, you can potentially gain access to a, an RPC server which you would not normally be supposed to access. And therefore you may be able to find security bugs in that. Okay. So I've got actually the lot, all the boilerplate code. I have my client. I have my marshalling code. I have my mechanism to get the data to generate my marshalling code. All I now need is to generate the client itself. And this turned out to actually be not that difficult once I'd, once I'd solved the initial problem. All it's just a case of generating a, a code which does the marshalling. But of course, you do have to do things like mapping of types. So of course, I wanted this to be as C sharp as possible. Like I didn't want you to have to simulate C, C style types with pointers and things like that. Everything had to be fully managed. It had to contain no unsafe code, no direct memory reference code, unless there was some really weird edge case which required it. Uh, so of course, things like primitive types are really simple. Integers just map to integers. Uh, if you have an outbound parameter, you make it out int. Pretty simple. And of course, if you have an in-out parameter, you can pass it by reference. Um, but of course, things like structures. Uh, structures usually are bigger than primitive types, which means they can't be fitted into, say, a single register or easily on the stack. And so a common idiom for when you're programming these interfaces is to pass it by a, by pointer. Now, you're not expecting something to write back into that structure. You're not really passing it by reference. But instead, you're actually just passing it by pointer for performance and convenience. But of course, I don't need to do that in C Sharp. I can trust the .NET runtime that it will work out that, OK, if I want to pass a 16-byte value on the stack, a GUID, for example, it will sort out passing that as efficiently as I can possibly manage. So I can actually remove that pointer reference in the case of normal structures and pass it by value and then not actually have to worry about it. And again, this massively simplifies your calling of clients. Things like strings, I of course just map them both to the string type and then deal with it at the marshalling layer, whether they're ANSI or Unicode. Whereas of course in a C implementation, you'd have to have distinct string, um, string types for those. And then you also have things like unique pointers. And unique pointers are pointers, which unlike the reference type before, can have a value of null. And that now, that null value must be transported across the link. It does that by setting that reference, that referent value in the marshalling to zero. Uh, 
and that indicates a null pointer. Um, now, of course, that introduces a problem. If we're passing a structure, in C sharp, a structure is a value type, it can't be null. It can't actually be null. But we can't also use the ref or the out keywords because for type safety reasons, you're not passing a pointer, you're actually just passing, a, you must always provide a value, you can't pass null. But fortunately, C sharp, uh, .NET at least, has the nullable type. So this is like optional type, and basically it says, does this have a value or not? And I use that information to infer, okay, this GUID was passed as a unique pointer, it has no value, therefore I assume it is null. But of course, if you have, say, a reference type like string, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then a few others, arrays, stuff like that, all, very, all simple mapping. System handle maps to it concrete, concrete classes which implement the various NT native types. So NT file, for example, implements file handles. So really simple example of C-sharp output. We go back to our original func IDL file, uh, which we saw before when we generated the, the marshalling code. Um, the first thing to notice is that that binding handle disappears. And that's because that binding handle just is used to reference, say, the server you're connecting to. And of course, if we wrap this up in a C-sharp class, a .NET class, well, that can all be contained within that class reference. We don't have to do that uh, explicitly. So we can remove that. So it simplifies the interface again. And then we just have an inbound parameter, and then an out int for the outbound parameter. And then, of course, we just return int. And then internally, what we do is we create this Marshall Buffer class. That Marshall Buffer class is something I wrote to do this parameter marshalling, and I just generate the code to say, right, okay, write parameter zero. Notice how uh, it's called p0 instead of i, and that's because those ne that naming information gets lost in the translation, because the marshalling layer doesn't care that it's called i, it just can cares that it's an integer. Um, you then call send receive, which actually does the ALPC transport. You need a procedure number, but again, that's something you can pull out the server information. That returns you an unmarshal buffer, you read out your, your outbound parameter, you read your return code, job done. So we've obviously simplified that, that marshaling code to like five lines of, of actual code. With all the hundreds of lines of actual code sitting behind it somewhere else, right? Um, now, I wanted this also accessible from PowerShell. And while PowerShell does support outbound and reference-based parameters to, to function calls, it is a bit of a kludge. You have to, of course, define the, the parameter first, the, the variable first, and then use this special ref keyword. And of course, you can imagine this gets quite complicated quite quickly if you have to define like a ref uh, to a ref and all weird stuff like that. So uh, I decided actually I'll also implement a special output mode for C sharp code. So for PowerShell, what I do is I generate the C sharp class and then use like the add type and the C sharp compiler to generate an assembly at runtime. And then that's exposed by PowerShell because PowerShell will just reflect over the client so you can just call it directly. Um, the PowerShell generation will actually generate a special structure which contains all your outbound parameters. And so again, it simplifies it down. You have one inbound parameter, P0, and then everything else gets returned back through this structure. Uh, if you have like a ref parameter, which is in and out, you'll have a non-ref inbound parameter and then a, um, a non-ref outbound parameter in the structure. And because I'm not having to deal with the actual le real low-level marshalling code, that, that value doesn't have to be in the same place between the input and the output. So you don't have to worry about it being uh, manipulated. So, of course, again, in PowerShell, I've got various uh, different commands and functions. Uh, you have the get RPC client. If you pass it one of the parsed RPC servers from the first step, it will generate, it will generate a C sharp file. It will compile that C sharp file, emit a type for it, inst instantiate a copy of that type and return you a client. Now that client isn't currently connected. It's just like a prototype client. Uh, it, in order to actually create uh, make that connection, you can then call connect RPC client uh, without any other uh, parameters that tries to use the endpoint mapper to look up the ALPC server. But if that doesn't work or you don't know the explicit name, which you can pass as a separate parameter, you can try the, the brute force approach and do find ALPC port and see if that works. Uh, if you actually want the C sharp files themselves, there is a format RPC client command which you can even pass it like a large list of RPC servers 
give it an output directory, and it will actually output each of those servers as a separate C# -sharp file, and then you can compile it into your your actual C# -sharp application and call it directly from C# -sharp. Um, and also things like structures. If there's a structure there, there's actually a special property which allows you to use constructors. This is mainly for C# -sharp usage, where it's it's difficult to find the correct structure uh, because you don't necessarily have direct access to the reference the, to the name. Okay, so that is the implementation. Uh, let's just at least look at a few possible uh, uses for this, because of course, the main usage is I can now call arbitrary RPC servers on your system at runtime. I can just generate the code at runtime, call them from PowerShell, and potentially find vulnerabilities and exploits in it. Uh, but there are other uses for this information. So when you parse these RPC structures, of course, it's, as I said, it's just an object graph. Well, an object graph you can just compare, right? You can compare two object graphs and generate the difference between the two. So there's a compare RPC server uh, command in PowerShell, which will, in this particular case, output uh, any new servers which have appeared between two different um, sets of RPC servers, and also any which have been modified. Now, when I when I say modified in this case, all this does at the moment is say this RPC server has added, say, these five new new functions to it. And of course, that is kind of useful from a analysis perspective, because if you're trying to look for what new attack surface has been added to 1903, um, over 1809, for example, well, one of them is, what new RPC servers have you just generated? And also, what uh, new functions have been added to existing RPC servers? But of course, you could go deeper if you wanted to implement that yourself. You could say, has this parameter changed? Has uh, the RPC code also contains constraints? So did 1809 not have a constraint on this integer parameter? And now suddenly it does, which might indicate like a buffer overflow or an integer overflow was originally in 1809, and they fixed that uh, by constraining the types, which could be marshaled across the link. Who knows? Um, and the other thing, not that this is something I would likely to do because I'm not really a fuzzer, uh, you can, uh, everything is all reflectable because it's all managed code, uh, there's all that metadata, all that type information, and so you can fuzz it fairly easily. Uh, you can just reflect over all the functions in the RPC server, you can reflect over all the parameters, what types those parameters are, and you could use it, some sort of fuzzer like Peach. I think Peach may actually almost do this out of the box because it is a... Uh, the modern version is uh, uh, written in .NET. And fuzz all your parameters and invoke it on the client. And one of the advantages of doing it this way is because it's all .NET managed code, uh, it's not native code, uh, you could get it wrong and it will return you an exception, a managed exception, but you should hopefully not crash your client while doing this. Like if it gets to the other side, maybe you'll crash the server, but hopefully your client won't crash. It may just go, well, you... Uh, you sent garbage to the to the server and it rejected you, but it shouldn't actually cause like a fault due to like oh I've accidentally accessed this random part of memory which isn't mapped. So wrapping up, uh, you can just get this code today. Uh, you can either get the PowerShell module which is on the PowerShell gallery. Uh, all the source code is freely available on the GitHub page, um, and yeah, you can just pull this down and play with it today. Um, and let's just finish off with uh, some quick demos. So, I of course have uh, PowerShell running. Uh, I can import my module, uh, the NT Object Manager. NT Object Manager has so many other function uh, functions in there, uh, but the RPC server stuff is just one. And I also have uh, a, a really simple RPC server I've written. So this RPC server, of course, is something I wrote myself, but we just have the exe. We don't have the IDL file. Uh, we have a PDB file which allows us to get um, symbols. But if I start that up, um, we can then call uh, get RPC server, oops, and then pass it uh, my RPC server.exe. Okay, really quick, um, and we can see now that. Uh, we have uh, a single interface. And it's also worth noting that where it can, it will actually try and pull out like, okay, this is actually um, running on this RPC workshop uh, ALPC port. So we already know uh, the endpoint for this, this function. Uh, it contains all a list of procedures. So of course, as I said, from a, 
from an object graph perspective, we can just dump all the different procedures. And then inside there, you've got parameter information, which contains all the different marshalling code. Um, but of course, at this particular point, uh, we haven't actually got a client we can connect to anything. So now we go um, get RPC client and pass it the RPC interface. And you wait a tiny fraction of a second. And uh, if you now uh, get this, so I'll see, get members. Um, this now contains um, all the defined functions for our RPC interfaces. Um, and as I say, trying to map everything to everything. Of course, if you don't try and call anything on this, it's not going to work very well. So we need to connect it first. Okay, so we've connected. We can actually see if we dump that. It's now connected. It's connected to this RPC control, RPC workshop, ALPC port. Um, and so we can actually now do some stuff. So uh, we can actually just pick... Um, one of those functions, so let's pick, um, I don't know, test six. I don't know what it does necessarily, but like we can see what it, see what it does on the RPC server. Um, so we do test six, and it takes a string, so I don't know, hello, one, okay, and it returns something. And of course, if we now look on the RPC server itself, it's now printed hello, one, and just to prove that I'm not cheating, or if I am cheating, I'm, I'm doing quite well at cheating. Um, yeah, and then, okay. Yeah, and so of course you can just do this for, for anything, right? Um, I could get the RPC server for, um, App info, which is the UAC endpoint. Um, I'll just put the symbol path. I should hopefully have pulled symbols for this. Uh, and then in here, you've of course got um, all the various um, structures for calling UAC. We've of course all the various uh, definitions for that. And of course, you can now use this and invoke UAC directly without actually having to go by anything. And of course, you can just build a client, connect to it. Job done. Um, and then I suppose final thing, uh, just doing the diffing. So you can, you can actually save out your RPC server lists as some sort of serialized format. Um, so the idea here is if you want to diff between two versions of Windows, you can just generate this serialized format um, on your on one machine, take it to another machine, and then you can do the different uh, differing from there. So we sort of say output equals compare RPC server. Uh, we do 1903, 1809, and then we can see that, for example, these five servers were added in 1903 and, and potentially uh, are interesting to look at. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean these are completely brand new. So for example, audio server, I'm pretty sure it exists on 1809 and 1903, but they've rev revved the versions. So in this particular case, the audio server is kind of like uh, not really that new. But some of the others are potentially interesting. And of course, if you, if you list the modified servers, um, it contains the server, the server we compared against, and then any added procedures. And of course, you can then go into this and, and see what's there. So, oops, ah, you missed my final slide. So let's uh, just finally wrapping up with some possible things I may eventually implement if I ever get around to it. Uh, there is a different transfer syntax called NDR64, which has a different bytecode format and it has a different wire format. Uh, at some point I may implement this, but 99% of the time, even on a 64-bit system, most RPC server interfaces are actually defined as both classic DCE protocol and NDR64, and so you don't really need to implement both. Uh, but there's a few edge cases, and if Microsoft starts to eliminate classic DCE, maybe I would actually implement this uh, with more uh, functionality. There's still a few esoteric types which are, like, are pretty much never used on Windows, um, but maybe I'll implement those. Uh, 
RPC supports asynchronous uh, mechanisms. Now, it turns out you can actually just call an asynchronous method synchronously, and it seems to still work. Uh, most of those UAC functions are uh, officially asynchronous, but just work anyway. Um, and there's things like, while I'm using ALPC, I've actually added code which you could, if someone was interested enough, they could implement it, the transport layer for name pipes and uh, TCP. And I may even add server support at some point because sometimes uh, a privileged service may actually call out to a server and if you could impersonate that server and do some funky stuff, maybe you could actually exploit it that way. But that is the end of my presentation. Uh, of course, uh, if we have uh, questions in the audience, and I, I see we have a few questions on the, uh, uh, the slides as well, we can go through that, but thanks very much for listening. Well, thank you, Mr. Forshaw. Uh, any questions from the audience? No questions from the audience. Then we have the Slido questions. Uh, the top question asked, uh, is it possible to exploit RPC JSON desirable vulnerability? If yes, any gadget was public? Uh, in that case, I don't know specifically if there's any um, deserialization vulnerability. There's there's been JSON vulnerabilities, uh, deserialization vulnerabilities in certain .NET frameworks, which deserialize uh, RPC JSON stuff. But other than if it's in um, like uh, Pwn Tester's um, .NET serialization uh, uh, exploitation package, uh, unless it's in there, um, I don't know of any other public gadget for doing exploit deserialization for JSON. Okay, thank you very much. And the last Slido question, with three thumbs up, uh, do you have any thoughts why MS isn't creating a tool for RPC services? Don't they expect people to want to use RPC services from .NET? So I think the, uh, the fundamental problem is it's probably a lot of work for them to do because the RPC runtime itself isn't very amenable to implementing, actually being invoked by a managed language because of that reliance on having like correctly laid out stack frames and poking into memory buffers and all that sort of stuff. It just becomes quite a complicated process. Um, so I'm expecting the, the primary reason is just there's not enough time. And I think the secondary reason is the majority of, even though there's a massive amount of RPC servers on a, on a, on a new Windows system, um, either Microsoft actually implemented DLL to invoke the client, like, indirectly, so it may, they may write an API, uh, DLL, which exposes this, which you can just p-invoke from, from .NET, and you don't actually need the RPC client itself. That's something Microsoft considered to be sort of internal functionality. And a lot of people just use the fact that, .NET supports native COM interop. So actually, COM is just using the same sort of RPC channels under the hood, but it's implemented in a way which can be trivially implemented in .NET, whereas actually the RPC server itself is much more difficult to implement. So I think it's just there is there's not enough like reason for Microsoft to implement it themselves. That's basically it, I think. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thank you for the lecture today. Uh, please have another round of applause for Mr. Forshaw.